Okay, we're good. Yes. Okay, hi everyone. It's very nice to meet you all. Um, I'm sure we're also going to have some other people coming in as we go along, uh, but I'll get started. So my name is Olivia Rodokia, and um, I am a psychological associate registered with the College of Psychologists of Ontario. Um, I have been under supervised practice up until a few days ago, so this is a bit of a new change for me. And I'll give you a bit of my background before I jump into the book and the topic of today. So I did my master's in clinical psychology from Adler University, uh, which finished in 2015. And while I was there, my focus was on um, working with children. So I did my placement in the Toronto Catholic District School Board in assessment and in counseling with elementary school and high school students which I absolutely loved. It was a really wonderful experience. And towards the end of my program, we have to do a thesis or a major research project. And so I decided on doing a research project that was a bit more hands-on because I really love something that can be used right away, uh, that's accessible for people. And I wanted to do something a little bit fun. So I've always had a passion for literature, for reading. Um, I've always wanted to write a children's book. So I figured it was the perfect opportunity to combine everything and do just that. Um, and since uh, my master's, I've been working in a private psychological clinic in Toronto, and I've been working mostly with adults. So I haven't really worked with kids um, too much since my master's. A few years, I worked uh, contract with the board as well, but currently just with adults in assessment and counseling. So it's really nice to be able to uh, chat with parents and families of children today and to talk about kids. Um, so the book itself is called Hugo and the Stabs. I'll have it here. It's a little guy. And I know you're all seeing this backwards. Um, but long story short, I wanted to create a resource for children and for parents, something that didn't feel clinical. Um, so something that parents could pick up or kids could pick up and it just feels like a normal book feels like a nice fun story, something that's relatable to kids and even to adults. I think we all relate to this sort of thing. Um, and then at the back of the book, uh, there's also a resource section for parents and teachers. So basically what I'm going to do today is I'll go through the book. Um, it doesn't take long. It's quite short. I may actually just read through it. And, um, and then we'll jump into the resource section and uh, I'll pull up a screen share and we'll go through all of that. And then at the end, um, I'm actually gonna be able to send out the PDF of this whole resource section to everyone. And feel free to send it around to whoever could benefit. Um, so what I'll do is we'll be able to see the pictures, the words will be backwards, but I figure we can just go through the book. So this is the front cover, that's little Hugo there. It's called Hugo and Sad. I was lucky to get a lovely illustrator on board. This is the picture here. Hugo can do anything. He lets nothing stand in his way. No tree is too tall to climb. No pond is too deep to swim. And no ball is too fast for him to catch. Hugo is always happy playing with his friends. And when he's alone, Hugo always finds something nice to do. One day, Hugo notices something that wasn't there before. He feels something different. Hugo doesn't want to climb trees anymore. He doesn't want to swim with his friends anymore. He doesn't want his favorite foods anymore. And he even has a hard time sleeping. All that Hugo wants to do is be alone. Is he bored? No, there's always lots for Hugo to do. It's because the sad showed up. Can you see the sad there? His friends ask, what's wrong, Hugo? Why don't you want to play with us anymore? Hugo doesn't know how to tell them about the sad. His friends can't see the sad like he can. He tries to show the sad with his hands, but his friends don't quite understand. They think it's a game, and this makes Hugo frustrated. Hugo tries to speak to a grown-up, but the words jumble up inside. He tries to write it down, but the lines don't go the way he wants. 
no matter how hard he tries, Hugo can't figure out what to do with the sad. The sad makes Hugo feel very down because it can be very heavy sometimes. This happens almost every day. The sad grew and grew so much that Hugo wanted to run away. When he tries to hide in the closet, the sad is in the closet too. He tries to run and run as fast as he can, but the sad always catches up. Why does the sad always follow me? Hugo asks himself. He wraps his arm around himself and heaves a long sigh. All I want to do is curl up into a ball and just pretend I don't exist. Not a bit, not at all. So that is what Hugo does. Hello, so here's a friendly voice and looks up. What's wrong, Hugo? Asks Sammy the snail. Are you lost? Are you hurt? Are you playing a game? I don't know, Hugo cries. I don't know how to show you and I don't know what to tell you. It's the sad, it won't leave me alone. I've tried everything. Hmm, says Sammy. What's the sad like? Hugo stops and thinks about it. Well, I can only see it when I close my eyes, but I feel it next to me everywhere I go. I have a fun idea. Let's draw it. You've got to express it so you can see it. Hugo is surprised. He never thought about drawing it before. How do I draw that? Hugo asks Sammy. Just pick a color and put the sad onto the paper. Try it. I don't think I can, Hugo gasps. The sad is just too big, it won't fit. Don't think about it, the sad will draw itself. Let the crayon move the way it wants to. Just go with the flow, says his friend. Hugo takes in a deep breath and tries what Sammy the snail suggests. Go with the flow whispers Hugo, and so he draws left and he draws right. The crayons move high and low in every which way. He chases the sad all over the paper. The more Hugo draws, the better he feels, until the sad is all there on the paper. Sammy is right. The crayons and colors help him to express what he could not say, and the sad doesn't seem as scary anymore. I don't know if you can see, but the sad is now very tiny and running away. I feel a little bit better, but I still feel the sad watching me. Now what? You did a great job drawing out the sad, but sometimes if we let the drawing stick around too long, the sad will stick around too. Maybe this blue balloon can help take the sad away. Hugo lets out a long hmm and imagines what he can do with the big blue balloon to take the sad away. Sammy watches with a smile as Hugo puts all of his drawings in a pile and rolls them together. Then he ties them to the blue balloon. Are you ready to let the sad float away so it doesn't bother you anymore? Hugo takes another deep breath and nods. I'm ready. Hugo lets go. And so up, up, up the balloon goes. The higher the balloon goes, the further away the sad feels. Finally, the balloon disappears into the sky along with the sad. Hugo smiles. You did it, cheers Sammy. But Hugo has one more question. What if the sad comes back? What do I do then? I'll tell you. Close your eyes and imagine this. Whenever the sad comes around, you can draw it out with crayons and colors. And whenever the sad gets you down, you can send it floating away with a big blue balloon. Go with the flow and let it go. With a warm heart, Hugo the Hedgehog smiles and says, Sammy, instead of feeling sad, now I feel happy to have you as my friend. Thank you. Hugo walks back home with Sammy. He spends all day playing outside with his friends, eating his favorite food, laughing and smiling again. Hugo feels good. He really can do anything. And he wants you to know, so can you. So that's the end of the actual story. And then on the next few pages, they're actually blank. 
and it leaves space for a child or anyone really to color. So they get to do just what Hugo did in the book and they can draw out the sad. So it says, grab some crayons and color out what the sad looks like to you. So there are four pages of that. And then afterwards, you'll see the resource section. And that's what we'll be going through next. So as you can see, it's a pretty overall lighthearted story. And um, I know that it's not always that easy to uh, feel better and not feel sad at all anymore. Um, but it's just a really nice light story that's relatable for kids and, and for everyone. And uh, it just goes through one of the many activities and many tools there are uh, to help build emotional resilience and to help uh, a child feel better. And uh, this activity goes for adults too. <laughs> we use this a lot in practice. So um, what I'll do is before I do uh, a screen share, I'll just, um, I'll just chat a little bit about sadness and emotional resiliency itself. So <clears throat> um, I know there was a question actually that I got earlier about uh, what tools do we use if the child doesn't have a diagnosis? And that's what building emotional resiliency is all about. Um, so, you know, without a diagnosis, you can still feel quite sad and you can still be going through a lot of challenging situations. And when we can build a strong foundation of emotional resiliency and communication and feeling safe, that's going to help a child um, to be better prepared when a situation becomes tougher or when they are faced with stronger feelings of sadness, let's say, or when they are possibly faced with a diagnosis. Um, so basically all, everything I'm talking about today and the tools that are in the resource section and what we'll chat about can all be used with children without a diagnosis. Um, and they can also be used with kids with a diagnosis. So it goes for everyone. Um, and then there is a difference in the sense that if um, you notice a child um, may have clinical symptoms or does get a diagnosis, then there would be steps to get treatment and help that would be beyond what we're discussing today. And we'll chat a little bit about that um, towards the end as well. Um, but in general, I mean, sadness is something we've all experienced. <laughs> It's a very normal human thing, it's a normal human emotion. And uh, being able to feel sad is a good thing. So for children, I mean, there's so many things that can cause sadness in a child. Anything from school issues, interpersonal issues with friends, family, illness, um, and a, a wide variety of things. And so, um, I would love to see, I don't know if we can, but uh, it would be, or just to reflect, but it'd be great to think about, you know, how many of you have been noticing sadness in your child or a child that you're close to recently or um, in the past. And just start to think about what are those things that you were noticing specifically about your child and how they were acting, what they were saying, how you started to notice it. Um, with with depression and sadness, um, the difference is that sadness becomes depression when the problems are clinically significant. That's the term that we use. So when it causes significant impairment in a child's life, and that could be significant impairment at home, at school, where they can no longer function to a normal level, um, that's when it becomes clinical and that there may be a diagnosis. And it's characterized, depression is characterized by chronic feelings of sadness, worthlessness, um, irritability, or loss of pleasure, loss of joy in activities that that child really loves. So, you know, going back to the book, Hugo was just not enjoying the things that he loved to do. He wasn't really enjoying playing with his friends. You know, he didn't even really enjoy his favorite foods anymore. He found he wasn't having as much fun or laughing as much. So all of those things, are things that we would see in kids, um, as well as issues uh, with sleep um, and irritability. Sometimes irritability might be more present even than sadness. And sometimes that can be 
um, misunderstood as something else, uh, but irritability definitely can be a sign of um, an early sign of depression and sadness in general. So um, that's that's the difference there. I'll actually pull up the, the screen share now. Okay, so I think this is working. I just have a list here and I'll give everyone a minute to read through this, but these are some symptoms of depression. So some of the things that I was just chatting about and uh, you'll see at the top that it, it says it can show itself sometimes as irritability instead of sadness, which is something that we don't often think about. We always feel like, oh, sadness would be really, really present, but in some kids that's not the case. And then in a lot of kids, it can also show as something somatic, so physical complaints, feeling sick, oh, I can't go to school today, I'm not feeling well, stomach aches, headaches, not, not going to school, right? A lot of staying home. Um, again, not showing interest in things they used to enjoy, that change in appetite, weight loss, um, not sleeping or sleeping too much, being sluggish, just not having the same energy that they used to, um, feeling guilty even for certain things. That's like an, an irrational guilt. Um, tough time concentrating and, and making decisions. So this one this is interesting because uh, in schools, and this is something I noticed when I worked in the schools, is that sometimes it's not easy to tell the difference between kids who are experiencing tension difficulties or things like ADHD. Um, and sadness because sometimes it can look similar. So things like being irritable or not being able to focus might come off as looking like an attention issue when really it can be depression or sadness. So that would be something to um, look more into before any sort of flash decision is made. And then of course, if things are quite serious, you might they might have thoughts of harming themselves or ending their lives. Um, and in that case, I mean, we're not talking about really clinical issues today, but if you do feel like a child you know or your child could have clinical depression, then the steps would be to talk to your family doctor. Um, there are resources at school as well. It could be a counselor. Um, they do do counseling in school or they may be able to refer out for an assessment or do the assessment in school itself. And we'll talk about some of the things, uh, treatment later on. So in terms of just reading the book with your child, um, and it doesn't have to be this specific book. I mean, there's so many books out there now about mental health for kids, and it's amazing. The market's really growing. There's a lot more awareness now about mental health which is really amazing, especially for kids. And so I have seen quite a few children's books around things like anxiety, depression. Um, so there's a whole lot of resources out there. And uh, so these tips would, would go for those books too. And uh, so some of the points here, even before you start the book is, um, you know, talk to them about the topic. Oh, you know, this is the sad. What do you think, what do you think the book might be about and, and see what the child says and okay so why don't you tell me a little bit about your experiences with sadness have you ever felt sad or when was the last time you felt sad and kind of just open up that conversation before you even read the book um, and then you know it's a great discussion to have afterwards as well especially with the coloring pages because it opens up to you know keep the activity going and you know, just have the child reflect, okay, what was it about? And, and how did that make you feel? And you know, have you ever felt like Hugo felt? You know, did any of your friends know how you felt? And were you able to talk to any of your friends about it? And I know every child is so unique and so different and some kids will gladly open up about their feelings and are very communicative about them and others don't. Some kids are very affectionate and will ask for the hug when they need it and others won't. Um, so 
it may be easier for the kids that express themselves readily <laughs> to to open up about their feelings you know when reading a book like this with their parents and uh you know for the kids that are more withdrawn or less communicative about feelings um this could be a good chance you know when they're able if if and when they're able to relate with a story character it's a bit easier to then talk about their own experiences um, and even if they don't want to talk about their experience with with you that's okay you know the point is they're reading it and they're probably feeling a level of um, engagement with the story with the character and they're learning something and even if they don't talk to you about their feelings you can definitely move forward and be like oh god look you know at the end of this book there's a few pages for you to color as well and for you to draw out the sad and so you know here's some crayons and our pencil crayons markers and you know whenever you want the book is here and uh you can you can color too and just leave it in their hands and not not push it if uh if you don't see them super open to it because everyone moves up at their own pace so and i think another question to ask um that's not here but that's something nice is you know have your child uh, or give your child the autonomy to problem solve for Hugo in other ways. So, okay, so we saw how Hugo um, dealt with his sad and he colored and then he let it go in a balloon. Um, but, you know, maybe he could have done something different. And what do you think he could have done? What's, what's something else that maybe helps you that could have helped Hugo too? And that gives you know, that gives the child, it puts the child in a place of power to be able to say, oh, you know, like this worked for me once and I think it could work for him too. And I've, you know, this, or maybe this, this sounds fun and this could help me. So even creating a fun list of things on one of the pages or on a separate page of fun activities that they think would help. You know, the activities don't have to be official or psychological um, or backed by research. If your child thinks that something helps them it helps right so just creating a list and, and their own resource and putting the power into their hands uh, is really important um, probably one of the most important things right especially for kids who are in tough situations and maybe feel powerless a lot of the time especially if they're dealing with the diagnosis and illness so, so doing that could also make uh, a child feel really good so just chatting a little bit about um, resilience itself. We have two terms that we use that some of you may already be familiar with, uh, protective factors and risk factors. So protective factors are things um, or part, parts of a child's life that gives them a really strong emotional and mental foundation and um, means that they're they're a bit less likely to go on to develop mental health issues it doesn't mean that they won't face mental health issues if they have a lot of protective factors it just means that they're they're going to come into that situation more prepared and with more tools and better able to handle the situation that arises um, risk factors on the other hand do just the opposite so they're factors that would negatively impact a child's well-being um, and, you know, each child comes into the world uh, in, in their own unique circumstance and family, and home, uh, socioeconomic status, environment, country. And so uh, every child's situation is going to be very different. So it's great even for, you know, parents to take stock of, of these factors and say, okay, you know, taking a look at your lives, family lives, a child's life and saying, what are the protective factors in my child's life and maybe what are some risk factors start to think about how those things might be impacting the child and then if you do come up with certain risk factors you know how could those be changed how could those maybe be mitigated in some way or if they can't be and the risk factors can't be changed how can we add in more protective factors what can we do to build resiliency, even though there are risk factors. So some of the risk factors here 
and there are many, these are just some examples. Um, poverty, relationship issues within the family, between um, parents, between siblings, parental illness, that could be mental or physical, having a death in the family, uh, low self-esteem, illness, if the child has an illness or a diagnosis, bullying. So we know so much happens at school and some things, you know, as parents, you don't hear about. Um, so it could be a lot going on at school. And uh, there are a variety of other things, even things that you might be thinking of right now that are not on the paper. Um, some protective factors that, um, that enable a child to bounce back. It's a, a really nice term to use in this, uh, in this case. So, you know, if there's a situation, child feels really sad or anxious, having those protective factors are going to make that period shorter or they're going to be able to come out of that let's say that hole quicker so some of the protective factors include having a really strong and caring relationship with family so really really that's feeling safe you know a child really needs to feel safe safety and love are the two biggest things so Something that I like to talk about in terms of communication between parents and children. For example, when you're talking about the book with your child or when you're trying to have a conversation outside of reading a book, but about how that child is feeling, you really want to build a strong, trusting foundation, foundation in terms of communication. So again, some kids might just blah, 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 and communicate really easily and others it takes them a long time to open up so listening is extremely important so we want to um, we want to be able to sit and listen to our child without interrupting without asking too many questions and without trying to problem solve um, a lot of people you know, me included, we have a tendency to problem solve when someone comes to us with a problem or they're venting, uh, or they're talking to us about a situation that's impacting them. We want to find ways to help. It's just a natural thing that we do. We want to be able to give resources. Okay, why don't you try this? Let's problem solve and do this. Or you might relate and you might have been in a similar situation. You want to tell that person right away what helped you. And okay, yeah, I was in it and this happened to me and I did this and it helped a lot. So why don't you try that? And what can happen sometimes if um, we jump into that is the person on the other end might not feel entirely heard. And especially with kids who are very sensitive and you know it takes a lot for them to be vulnerable. We want them to feel 100% heard by us. And that involves, um, you know, having a lot of compassion and gentleness and ease when you're going into the conversation. And, um, you know, if you are noticing your child might be sad or might be going through something, I mean, you all know your children best, so you'll do this however works for you. But um, saying something as simple as like, oh, hey, buddy, why don't you come sit on the couch? And I noticed this and this and this. And uh, if you want, you want to tell me a little bit more about that or you know about what's been going on and fill in the blanks and then just sit back um, and listen if they start to talk and the one helpful thing to do uh, in terms of speaking to your child during that process is just reflecting back to them what they're feeling so rather than jumping into problem solving mode saying something like Okay, so what I hear you saying is that, you know, you felt kind of sad today at school because this happened with Billy. And so you're not adding anything new to the conversation, but you're just showing your child that you're listening and you're understanding what they're saying. And that means a lot. And that's going to really help in building that strong, trusting foundation for your child to then be able to express themselves more and open up more deeply later down the road. Um, so just going on here.
So again, some ways to increase the positive, the protective factors is making sure the child has a strong relationship with an adult that they can trust. So even if that's not a parent, it could be an aunt, an uncle, a family friend, a teacher, um, as long as they have someone that they can feel really safe messing with and sharing with. And encourage it, you know, encourage. If you see that a child has a really great relationship with a teacher, you know, say to them, listen, you know, if you, if you are feeling something, you know, it would be great if you could tell your teacher and I'm sure they would appreciate hearing it from you, even if you don't feel like talking about it at home. And that also helps them to feel safe and, and not guilty if they don't want to speak about something at home. And a healthy lifestyle is super important. Um, so as, as I am a clinical practitioner, but I do practice more in a holistic way. So I think integrating physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health is super important because when one of those pieces is missing, it's very hard to become whole in a sense. Um, so you really want to make sure that a child is, um, active or as active as they can be in whatever circumstance they're in. Um, even if that means just doing a little bit of walking or just sitting outside in nature, um, or if they can be quite active, then maybe doing some sports, or just getting outside and playing with friends if possible. Healthy eating, a healthy diet. Um, I often suggest to chat with a nutritionist or a naturopath, uh, look into any food allergies or sensitivities, something that's important to keep in mind is that sadness or mental illness, anxiety doesn't just come from up here or here. Uh, we actually have, they call it a second brain in our gut, in our stomachs. And what that means is that when we have unhealthy gut bacteria or when we have any sort of imbalance there, that can almost directly impact our mental health. It can impact energy levels, it can impact our mood, it can impact anxiety and sleep. Um, and that's something that we don't often think about when we think about mental illness. So making sure um, you know, the gut is taken care of, whether that's probiotics, really healthy diet, checking out food sensitivities, those are all really, really important things uh, to do at the beginning, just to rule things out, make sure, again, they have a good foundation in that way. And um, connection and community is also so important. So, you know, spending time with friends, uh, family, having fun, laughing, uh, um, doing fun things, all, again, you know, to the best of their ability, all of those things. Um, a part of that holistic view of a person and uh, of a child. So in terms of things you can do at home with your child, if uh, they're struggling with sadness. Um, and again, if you see that something is prolonged and chronic, so I'd say more than, you know, more than a few months um, that you see that your child is white down, significantly down, significantly irritable, I would reach out again to a family doctor or school psychologist uh, and chat about possibility of an assessment. Um, and then there would be recommendations made at that point. So again, monitoring is really important. And what you can do as a parent is even just keep a journal. Um, keep a journal, monitor how they're doing day by day. And uh, that'll be easier for you to be able to look back, you know, even a week ago, a few weeks ago, just to see what the changes are. And even dotting down, you know, if something happens a particular day that you feel might have affected your child, just jot, jot, jot that down on the day of, just so you have a running log of how your child has been feeling. Talking to them. So we, we chatted about this already, but just being in a really non-judgmental space with them and active listening. So that's something that we talked about. And the active listening piece, you know, goes for adults too. And I think that 
having healthy adult relationships is also extremely important for a child, especially a child who has risk factors, vulnerabilities. Um, we want to do our best to have healthy relationships as adults, be positive role models for our kids, and even like be able to express our emotions to our children and not be afraid of that and show them that it's okay to be vulnerable and to be emotional. And you can be a really great role model in that sense too. So if you see that your child, maybe it takes a lot longer for them to open up or they're a bit less willing to do some of these activities or, you know, draw in the book or talk about it. You know, when they're around one day and they're doing their own thing, you can easily just grab the book yourself, maybe a separate sheet of paper. And you can just, just kind of chat to yourself a lot and say, you know, today was a bit tough and today I felt a little bit sad because this happened. And, you know, I think it might be helpful for me to draw out my sad today and, um, and draw it and just have them watch you. And you don't need to make the connection and say, oh, why don't you do it too? Or, you know, do you think you want to do this? You don't have to. You can just do it on your own as an example. And uh, then they may, out of curiosity, try it themselves. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, you can even, they use a balloon in this book. That would be a helium balloon. Um, but it doesn't have to be, it can be anything. It can go in a bottle. It can go in a campfire afterwards. It can get stored in a special box. Um, you can come up with a lot of different creative ways to let sad go. Uh, mentally is also a really great one. So just being able to visualize it. Um, you have it on paper, the child can close their eyes, they can visualize it, and then you can talk them through it and uh, say, okay, um, now imagine rolling up the paper and putting it in a really, really big helium balloon, whatever it looks like to you. It's got dinosaurs, it's got whatever on it, and you're going to take it somewhere really cool. You know, they want to take it to the beach or a mountain or wonderland or the top of a roller coaster let them be super creative with it and then get them to do a few deep breaths and say, okay, when you're ready, you can hold on to it as long as you need to. And then when you're ready, you can let it go and keep your eyes closed because you can watch it float away. So you can get, you can get creative with this. Down here, we have some of these things we were just talking about. So again, you can do it in your mind. You don't have to do it with an actual balloon. And something that I like to think about and that I often um, talk to, you know, talk to clients about is the idea that when we are able to pinpoint and focus on our anger or our sadness or our anxiety and feel where it is in our bodies and name it, give it a name. It could be anything. It could be Bob or it could have a very complicated name, or it could just be called red. Maybe it's just a color. Um, maybe it's the name of a character that you already know. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the name is, but as long as you're able to kind of just visualize where it is in you, in your body, right? Because we experience these emotions physically, as well as just emotionally and mentally. You know, we can feel emotional pain in our bodies. And so, and even do this with your child and get them to close their eyes and say, okay, where are you feeling the sad? Is it in your body somewhere? Do you feel it in your tummy? Like, is your tummy a little upset or do you feel it in your chest? Maybe it's hard to take a really deep breath. Maybe do you feel it in your throat? Like sometimes you want to cry or in your head. And once they're able to find that spot, you know, ask them, hey, well, you know, what does it look like? Well, think about what does it look like there? And then give it a name. And the idea is when we're able to name something and single it out in a sense and actually put our attention on it, it loses its power. When we don't talk about something and we don't, we choose to ignore, we choose to suppress and push it away, it gains power and it grows. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind when you're doing activities like this and when you're helping your child and, and yourselves. So this is an equally effective strategy for adults. And check-ins. So this is a mood thermometer. This is something you can print out. It's also in the book. 
when you're doing monitoring or if you have a journal, you can just ask your kid every day, you know, okay, take a look at the thermometer. Where are you feeling today? And have them point it out. Then you can jot that down and maybe do it in the morning and at night and see how things change during the day. Um, and it's kind of fun for a child. Of course, this is all depending on how old the child is, but we do this with adults as well. Okay. And so in terms of uh, next steps, so this is something we chatted about already, but uh, if you feel that, you know, you're implementing strategies, you're not seeing any improvements over time, what tends to be the case with sadness that's not clinical is that when the stressor or the situation resolves, the sadness also resolves. If there is a situation um, that's not resolving uh, or has resolved, but you're seeing a continuation of the sadness, or of course, if a child is in a situation that is chronic and there's a chronic stressor, um, that's also what we would refer to as adjustment difficulties and adjustment disorders when there's a specific situation that happens and an individual reacts in an extreme way to the situation um, that results in impairment and functioning in their lives. So that kind of situation could be anything from a diagnosis of an illness or a car accident or, you know, seeing something happen at school, perhaps like a a code red that, you know, drill that really impacts a child. And even once that code red drill is gone, you still see an impact in the child. Um, so when it becomes more chronic, uh, then you would reach out to a psychologist, doctor, teacher, social worker, and see what resources are available. And again, um, I think one of the last things that I'll say is that, you know, as adults, we are the role models for our children. So one of the most important things that we can do is to focus on our own mental health. Um, you know, maybe see our own therapist, um, use strategies for ourselves. And I know it's, it's tough to take the time for yourself when you're, you're so busy with family and work and, and supporting children. Um, but it's extremely important to take time to quote unquote, fill your own cup, because only once your own cup is full, it can overflow onto others and, and help others. And when we are very depleted, we're not as effective in terms of helpers for our family, or for our loved ones. And so it can be really, really tricky to find the time to focus on yourself and, and for that self-care. Um, but it is one of the most beneficial things that you could do for your child. If you feel like you're experiencing some of your own um, anxieties or, or depression or sadness or even just general stress, um, it's going to, you know, chatting with some professional is going to provide you with some really good tools and really good understanding um, of yourself and how you know, our thoughts, um, emotions, our actions interact. And that's also going to help you better understand your child. If, for example, your child is resistant to talking to someone. It could be very helpful for parents themselves to chat with someone. Um, in fact, right now in my work, uh, what I'm focusing on with adults and with women specific, specifically sorry, is self-care. So um, creating space for women, mothers, um, working women to focus on their self-care in order to better, better be there for their loved ones and for themselves. Um, so I will leave it at that for now. I'm going to give this PDF um, out to everyone and, and you'll have that. And that's exactly basically what you'll find at the back of the book as well. So I'm going to stop the share and we'll have time for questions. Thank you, Olivia. That was really interesting to learn a lot of those strategies and tips for helping kids. I wanted to say, is, is there anybody who has questions now for Olivia? While you think about it, <laughs> I do have one that we received in advance. And it's about a 13-year-old uh, boy who's in remission from cancer. 
And uh, he uh, sometimes makes statements, mom said, like about death, saying, I don't want to die or I'm going to die. And they ask him, why do you say that? And he says, I don't know. So they're asking, how can they help him in this case? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough thing to hear a child say and <laughs> to hear a child talk about. And um, there isn't necessarily an exact right way to go about that. I think as parents, you know your child best, you know how to talk to your child. I would think about also as parents, you know, what does my child know about death? You know, do they know anything about death? Is death some mysterious, scary thing that they've seen in movies or heard about or, you know, have heard people talk about? in relation to cancer or other things and, and reflecting on their level of understanding around that and their perception of it. Um, and maybe even chatting with them and having a bit of a healthy conversation about that piece. Um, if the child's unwilling to talk about why they're feeling that, but in order to calm that child and, and um, to reassure them, I think, it would be important to, you know, have them reflect, but also focus on the present moment. So the child's in remission. Um, and, you know, parents could say something like, you know, you were sick and, and we had such an amazing team of people helping to make you better. And you worked so hard to get better and you were super motivated and you did an amazing job. And here you are today and you're healthy. You're healthy today. And that's, the most important thing and that's the most amazing thing and really have child focus on the fact that today in the present moment they're doing amazing and then have them focus on okay like when you keep doing great and keep doing these what are the things you want to do and what do you want to get out there and experience and kind of shift the focus to, to, to the positive side of things um and again, just going back quickly to the, the discussions around death, that's going to vary so much uh, between different families. If someone part of a certain religion or spiritual, um, so I won't comment too much on that, but uh, you can think about certain conversations, um, healthy conversations around that to have, even as a family or not, not to bring it up necessarily even out of the blue, but if watching a movie that has, you know, death related things, that would be a time to bring it up in a very casual way. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think that's important, as you mentioned, for this child maybe to focus on the present, that they're doing okay, and on the future things to look forward to, and not so much, I know it's traumatic what happened, but uh, try to focus on the present, right? So, yeah. thank and you. And I think if that, if that does persist, uh, you know, just like I was mm -hmm. saying earlier, if parents are seeing that persisting over weeks uh, or months, these comments, then that, that might be something that that child can talk to a school psychologist about or um, yeah, to have a professional step in because they're gonna be able to have a really great conversation with the child and reassure them and give them some tools to manage those anxious thoughts. Great, any questions for Olivia? You can speak up or you can type it in the chat if you want. I guess I had one question while you were speaking was about, I know a lot of the strategies are more for younger children because of your book, but for teenagers, what would you recommend for strategies for them to deal with um, or to build resiliency in, in teens? Or how could they cope with sadness? Yeah, I mean, teens are, teens are amazing and um, you know, they, they all have their own unique way of being. So uh, actually this, like this strategy in particular, the art itself, like art therapy is used for all age groups, for adults, for teens, for kids. Um, so that can always be something that's helpful. Again, not necessarily having to use a blue balloon or anything like that, but there are certain um, the visualization exercises that can be helpful. You know, encouraging a teen to keep a journal, that's something that they're open to. You know, being able to release our thoughts, let go of them if we're not necessarily talking about it, we're not in therapy. A journal is kind of like a personal therapist in a way. It's very, very helpful just to be able to write and get out those thoughts every day, even if it's just for two minutes, every morning or every night. At night is particularly helpful because we don't go to sleep with all those thoughts in our mind. We're able to let them go and put them on paper before we go to bed and maybe sleep a bit better. 
Um, and as teens, I think it's so important, you know, relationships are extremely important as a teenager, right? Having strong friendships and having trusting friendships. Um, so if, if the teen does have those already, that's amazing. If they don't, kind of figuring out how to help them find some very meaningful connections with other students, whether that's just extracurriculars or even a group therapy format. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> now you said you were going to share a resource, um, the PDF. Ooh. Would you be able to share it here, or did you want to email it to me and then I can email it to all um, the attendees? Yeah, I guess I'll. I think what I'll do is I'll email it to you, and then you can email it out because I'm sure there are people not here today. That yeah. Yeah. Probably. Great. So everybody will get a copy of that, um, and we'll also post it on online, I guess, if it's okay with you <laughs> and yes. our social medias. And uh, this is being recorded, so you can watch it again. You can watch it with your kids, little ones, if you want the, to see again the part where Olivia is reading the book. And uh, her book is available, Hugo and the Sad, on Amazon, if you want to get your own copy. And um, just wondering if there's any, any questions. <laughs> I just give another chance. I want to mention as well for OPAC that OPAC is here to help uh, parents and families of children diagnosed with cancer. As most of you know already, your OPAC families here. Uh, and we do have uh, drop in virtual support sessions with our parent liaisons every Tuesday at 7 30, where we chat like this with uh, parents about any issues you have um, uh, to talk about just either your child's cancer resources or any non-medical advice that we can give, um, we're there for you. So, uh, oh, I see uh, James and Susanna wrote, thank you so much, Olivia. I really enjoyed that you read the book. Lovely. So, thank you. Yeah. Great. So I guess that's it. Um, we will record it. Like I said, it's been recorded. I'll put it up on our uh, socials and with Olivia's resources, you can send me that. And uh, yeah, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you to our great speaker, Olivia. And, thank you so uh, much for having me. This was a pleasure. Thank you. And have a great Canada Day long weekend, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Thanks again, Olivia. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.